I wanted to follow up on our recent episode covering the history of the police in ancient Egypt by diving deeper into specific historical anecdotes which were left on the cutting room floor. I find it's always greatly enlightening to hear from the past from the people who lived it. Here's a summary of the passages we'll be reading from, with timestamps for your ease of navigation. But first, a quick word from our sponsor. I spend a lot of time reading history books to make these documentaries, yet I still find myself with a growing list of titles I just don't have time to get to. I'm sure in your own busy life it can be tough to find the time to explore as many books as you'd like. Thankfully our sponsor Blinkist has a solution. Blinkist is an app that takes thousands of non-fiction books and uses experts to distill them down to their most essential ideas for you to easily digest with text or audio in just 15 minutes. This can be super helpful for engaging with subjects you'd never otherwise get to, or for making a short list of the books you definitely want to read in full. As an example, I've finally been able to delve into Stephen Levitt's Freakonomics, Yuval Harari's Sapiens, and Stephen Hawking's A Brief History of Time. It's honestly been extremely liberating and a huge breath of fresh air for my ever-curious mind. You can check it out right now by clicking the link in the description below to get a 7-day free trial. In addition, the first 100 people will get 25% off a full membership. So check it out. Law enforcement in ancient Egypt was omnipresent and got involved in all sorts of manners. Sometimes, their power could be abused. Luckily, there were means by which to remedy this by appealing to local commanders. For instance, here's a judicial petition from a man claiming that he had been improperly charged of missing a work quota and had been robbed of his garment. Quote, May my lord the governor hear the appeal of his servant. Your servant was harvesting in Hazar Assam. Your servant harvested and measured as always before stopping. And when your servant had measured the harvest and stored it as always, Hoshav Yahu ben Shobay came and took your servant's garment. When I had measured my harvest as always, he took the garment of your servant. All my brothers will testify for me. Those harvesting with me in the heat of the sun, they will also confirm that it is so. I am innocent of guilt. Now please, return my garment. Again, I petition the commander to return the garment of your servant. Grant him mercy and return the garment of your servant and do not confound me. It's a quaint 2600 year old story about a man's impassioned plea to rescue what is clearly his favorite garment. These sort of grumblings did not go unheard and could sometimes even elicit a response from the very top of the pyramid so to speak. Here is one such proclamation from Ptolemy VIII in 126 BC. He writes, quote, And they have decreed that the strategoi and other officials shall not impress any of the residents in the countryside for private services, nor requisition their animals for any private purposes, nor force them to feed calves or sacrificial animals, nor force them to supply geese or fowl or wine or grain or price for the renewal of office, nor compel them to perform work for free on any pretext whatsoever and they remit to the policemen throughout the countryside the penalties entered against them with regard to negligence in royal inspections, and for the produce they have mislaid, and for the sums handed over to them for arrears or other reasons, and which have disappeared up to the fiftieth year. However, this sort of action was not always enough to keep the peace, and we have numerous examples of how things could get out of hand when law enforcement ran amok. One account, dated to 194 BC, speaks of police brutality involving not just the local guardsmen, but also the chief of police. Apparently, these rogue agents of the law raided the workshop of a cobbler by the name of Peter Motis. The assailants dragged him through the village, beat him, and robbed several others. Upon release, the victims immediately sent a petition to the strategos in charge of their gnome. It went as follows, quote, To Ptolemaeus, Syngenes and Strategos, from Peter Motis, son of Petisus, Sevenarura Makimos, of those under Comenis, a crippled cobbler, of those from Tabtinis of Ptolemon district, but living in Oxyrinca of the same district. Of the first of the intercalary days of Mesor, year 8, Dionysius, police chief of the district, arriving in the village and entering my workshop with Demetrios and Apollonius the Isangelus, and Teos and Nectanibis, and other Ephodoi, seized me and led me through the village with every form of mistreatment and insolence and blows up to the middle of the street of the city, and they did not release me before shaking me down for four silver drachmas and thirteen hundred bronze drachmas, and they forced Phenerus' son Horos, another Makimos, to place at the bank in my name for Dionysius a promissory note payable to Areos, Epispudastes of the district, for forty-four silver drachmas, and in addition they forced the same Areos 
to accept the aforementioned 44 silver drachmas from Dionysius, disdaining me because I am helpless and crippled, and they also carried off the clothes that I was wearing. I ask that you not overlook me, but if it does not seem improper, please send dot 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 the text trails off here before then picking up with the following, and if this takes place, I shall receive succor from you. Year 8, Mizor, Intercalary Day 1, Farewell. To lighten things up a bit though, let's now take a look at another story on the complete opposite end of the spectrum. This story takes place in the dusty corridors of an Egyptian archive in the 2nd century AD. The building was filled with countless papyrus book rolls containing records which dated back decades if not centuries. Given the immense size of the bureaucracy of ancient Egypt, there must have been hundreds of such structures across the lands. Each would have been tended to by clerks, with public officials rotating through the management every few years. At every changing of the guard, the state of the archive would be assessed. This was a point of some contention at the Fayum archives of Tabtinus. Apparently, the rolls had fallen into disrepair over the years, but no one wished to take accountability. At every new round of management, a blame game would take place between the officials and the clerks as to who was responsible for the ever-worsening state of affairs. The first complaint seems to have been made around 70 AD, but some 40 years later things still had not been resolved. At some point, an impartial inspector was called in to take account of affairs. He writes the following, quote, The documents shown to me by the clerk Leonides were in some cases deprived of their beginning, or damaged, or moth-eaten. Since the books have been hastily moved from one place to another repeatedly, lying on top of each other and unattached, some were eaten away at the top because of the dry heat, and since they are being handled daily and their material is brittle, it happened that some were destroyed in parts, others without beginnings, and some had even fallen apart. It's no wonder that no one wished to be left holding that bag. The bureaucratic inaction got so bad that apparently the local strategos Apollonius even became involved decreeing to the head clerk Leonides, quote, Already before, I have ordered you, and I enjoin you now, to take over the documents in their present state. However, Leonides understandably dragged his heels on the matter, refusing to accept any roles from the previous officials until the new officials were present to sign off on the transaction. The unsuspecting government bureaucrats who walked in on this mess in 107 AD were Heracleides and Patron. They quickly realized that everyone was eager to stick them with the problem and now also refused to take any responsibility. The impasse continued for some time, with tensions rising. Apparently it was all too much for Patron, who left office before the end of his tenure and was replaced by his son Euangelos. And yet still, the complaints kept coming, and almost a decade later there had still been no action despite five successive prefects getting involved. Finally though, in 114 AD, the prefect Rutilius Lupus had had enough and finally forced Leonides, Heracleides, and Euangelos to jointly pay for the repairs. Yet even still, Heracleides refused to pay this sum, suffering fines until his death. Leonides too died shortly thereafter, leaving both of their heirs to take over the responsibility of the payment. Apparently, this all got wrapped up in the Egyptian court system with the heirs all suing one another over the dues. With matters now dragged out even further in legal proceedings, the prefect sees the properties of the various parties to guarantee their compliance. It seems that this finally worked. Some six months later, one talent was raised through the sale of property and finally paid to complete the repairs and transfer of the scrolls. Thus, by 124 AD, some 50 years after the first complaint was raised, the matter was settled. Or at least, that's where our paper trail ends. But while Egyptian bureaucracy could drag things out for eternity, it could also make sure that things actually got done. For instance, we have numerous examples from history when an edict goes out ordering that the whole empire perform sacrifice to the Roman gods and the well-being of the emperor. Previously, I'd always thought that such decrees were mere formalities, with few actually following up on the demand. Perhaps this was the case in some provinces, but apparently not in bureaucratic Egypt. Here, we have records that in response to a decree by Emperor Decius in 250 AD, masses of certificates were issued and collected to make sure that there was compliance. We have over 40 of these texts dated to the same area in the month of June, shortly after the order must have percolated out to the provinces. Similarities between the documents have led researchers to postulate that the process was highly standardized and organized. Here's one such certificate. It says, quote, To those appointed to oversee the sacrifices, from Aurelius Sakis, from the village of Theoxenis, and his children, Ion and Heras, staying in the village Theodelphia. We have always sacrificed to the gods, and now, too, in your presence. 
in accordance with the decree, we have sacrificed, and we have poured a libation, and we have eaten of the sacrificial offering, and we ask you to undersign, may you continue to prosper. Below this text, it includes the line, quote, We, Aurelius Serenus and Aurelius Hermas, saw you sacrificing, thus officially certifying the preceding statement. Such bureaucratic due diligence proved useful in other forms of governance. For instance, we know that Egypt collected massive amounts of fees and taxes from people within its lands. These were all regulated by a vast archival system with record-keeping personnel. But just as today, sometimes the most important choice a ruler could make was not who was taxed, but rather who was exempted from taxation. This seems to have actually been one of the more powerful tools wielded by Egyptian rulers to secure loyalties of various parties. Cleopatra, for instance, was quite the master at using such bribes to negotiate a cushy relationship with the Romans who increasingly involved themselves in the lands of the Nile. One incredible bit of papyrus we have explicitly spells out this tax carve-out to one powerful Roman. It reads as follows, quote, We have granted to Publius Canidius Crassus and his heirs the annual exportation of 10,000 artabas of wheat and the annual importation of 5,000 koan amphoras of wine without anyone exacting anything in taxes from him or any other expenses whatsoever. We have also granted tax exemption on all the lands he owns in Egypt on the understanding that he shall not pay any taxes, either to the state account or to the special account of us and others in any way in perpetuity. We have also granted that all his tenants are exempt from personal liabilities and from paying taxes without anyone exacting anything from them, that they do not even contribute to the extraordinary assessments in the gnomes or pay for expenses of soldiers or officers. We have also granted that the animals used for plowing and sowing as well as the beasts of burden and the boats used for transportation of the wheat are likewise exempt from the personal liabilities and from taxes and cannot be commandeered. Let it be written to whom it may concern so that knowing it, they can act accordingly. The proclamation ends with the scrawled Greek word genesto, make it happen. Some researchers believe that this last word was written by Queen Cleopatra herself as a final sign-off to officiate the document. While not a personal signature, if true, it's quite a remarkable find. I hope you've enjoyed these small windows into daily life in the past. I can't thank our researcher Chris and the website Papyrus Stories enough for digging these up for the rest of us. Definitely let me know if you'd like to see more of these short stories in the future, and if you haven't already, check out the rest of our How They Did It series. See you in the next one.